Welcome to the MAG Network Podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to this next edition of the MAG Network Podcast. Uh, I'm joined today by David Craig. David, do you want to just uh, quickly introduce yourself, tell us who you are, your involvement with MAG and possibly a, bit of, a little bit of the history of how you got involved with MAG? Okay, yeah. Hi Colin, I- I'm uh, David Craig. I am political rep for Blackpool MAG. Um, I joined MAG about 15 years ago because I was concerned about the uh, growing dangers that that, that are threatening our biker lifestyle and culture. Um, I actually passed my test in 1973, which is the year MAG was formed in response to the uh, the crash helmet law. But at the time, I was young. I wore a crash helmet anyway, so I had better things to do. But uh, regretfully, MAG didn't get my membership then, but they've had my membership for the last 15 years, and I'm very proud to be a member of uh, MAG. The, the, the main topic of conversation is going to be the... Uh the government's proposals for banning the sale of uh, internal combustion engines. Um, so what, what's your what's your general opinion on this as a, as a policy? Um, well, I think it's wrong. It's, it's plainly wrong. The uh, government policy is based on, uh, we have to cut emissions. I'm not a climate denier, we have to cut emissions. But uh, government policy is based solely on zero tailpipe emissions. Um, they've pushed us down to the down the uh, battery only route, and therefore they have uh, put industry off investigating other ways of, of reducing uh, emissions from transport. Um, it is quite simply wrong. They're preventing investment in alternative fuels. They overall battery power vehicles will increase the adverse impact environment uh, on the environment of vehicle traffic. It won't save the planet, planet, and the honest truth is that it's coming more and more to light that the UK is wholly unable on every front to support the replacement of internal combustion engine vehicles with battery electric engine vehicles. It just the, the numbers just don't add up. It will not happen. Yeah, I, I think um, say what what you're saying reflects uh, the the. The, the vast majority opinion of of, uh, of our of our membership and certainly the, the riders that uh, I speak to, whether they be members or non-members, is that people are not happy with the with the policy. It doesn't necessarily mean that they've got a particular stance when it comes to climate change or anything like that, but it does mean that uh, they think that this policy is simply just not going to work. It's not it's not going to be beneficial. It doesn't doesn't work. Now, obviously, Mag's activity on this area, we're all putting it under the umbrella of Operation Earthquake. Um, do you want to just quickly run through what Operation Earthquake is and um, and how that's uh, how that's worked for you so far? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure we all know that Operation Earthquake is Mag's uh, campaign to uh, fight against the uh, ill-conceived uh, um, policy the government put in place. Um, if you look on uh, in the current article, the current uh, issue of uh, Open Road, issue 108, page 52 and 53, my colleague uh, Michael Armstrong has written a very good article there explaining how far we've got with lobbying our MPs. Um, at the moment, we've got about 15% of MPs uh, lobbied. I think it says 10% in the magazine, but it's actually 15% lobbied. But we need to get up to 30 to 50% to show MPs that MAG is a force to take uh, uh, notice of. Um, I'm very keen that we do lobby MPs, MAG is of course as as well, and I'd ask that if you do agree with MAG's uh, proposal to uh, oppose the policy to ban the sale of new internal combustion powered vehicles, then please give some thought to how you can lobby your own MP, because those people can make a difference. Yes, I, th- I think, like you say, it's, it is important that uh, that we speak to as many politicians as possible, lobby as many MPs as possible. Um, so, what what what's been your experience with uh, with Blackpool Mag with, uh, with going through the process, shall we say, of, of Operation Earthquake? How has that gone for you to date? Okay, so just going through my personal experience first, because we lobbied my MP um, first. Uh, you can lobby your MP by letter or, or email. It's good to give them something in writing. Um, I sent my, I wrote a letter, sent it by email, got no response. I wrote another, I, I sent it again, got no response, apart from uh, uh, acceptance that had been uh, uh, delivered. Um, so I actually went down to see my MP at his weekly surgery. Um, when I got down there, 
he was most apologetic. Apparently, apparently it hadn't been my email hadn't been received, but he did read my letter while I was there, and I was quite surprised he actually agreed with everything I'd written there, which is basically the, the mag the mag uh, view of view of things. Um, his view: if you want to have an electric car, have an electric car, but it should not be by compulsion. Um, which quite surprised me, bearing in mind he is, uh, he is in the government and not in opposition, but uh, we'll come on to that a bit later. So after that, we um, lobbied the other three MPs that uh, uh, cover Blackpool Mag, so there's four in total. Um, so we've done all four now. Mine replied, uh, one other replied, and two others have yet to reply. So we are chasing them, we are chasing them up. Um, one good thing, the, the second MP that replied did offer a meeting outside of the sur outside of the surgery, which is good. Um, and he agreed to meet Blackpool Mag and not just his one constituent. So three of us went along to, uh, to meet the MP. Um, you only get 30 minutes of their time, but you do, you can prepare facts and figures. Um, you can go with a, and give a good, a, a good account of, uh, Mag's point of view and about why government, uh, this government policy is wrong. And again, I'd have to say the MP we spoke to was in some form of agreement with us. It, we, I was expecting to get a, a, a no, no, you're wrong response, but no, we didn't get that. We were, get, we, we were getting a, uh, a uh, positive response and that MP took an action away to ask some more questions about where this policy is going. Um, the other two MPs will chase up again now and hopefully we'll get some response from, from them. But coming back to it, if we meet an MP, if, we, if you meet the MP with MAG shown as a powerful, uh, powerful organisation, they listen to you more than if you're just a, 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 a little organisation on the side. Hence, refer back to Michael's uh, article in Current Open Road. Excellent. Yes, I think um, certainly from, from my experience is that um, you, you may go into these meetings with MPs thinking that you're just going to get a, a brick wall kind of response. Um, but I think very often people are finding that, yeah, it's, it's not as cut and dried as everybody would like, like you to think it is in terms of opinion on, on this particular policy. So I think um, one of the key um, things that, that I always look for is or where have we got areas of agreement with, with an MP? Um, they may not agree with everything that we're saying, but there may be areas where they think, well, actually, there's a point point there. And one, once you've got an area where there is an agreement, it's a lot easier then to expand on that um, and hopefully move to this point where where the um, the, the apparent solid um, support for this policy as it stands is possibly not as solid as it may, may appear from the outside. So, um, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a valuable lesson to learn for those who who are going to be uh, meeting with MPs and are discussing this. It may not be as hard a, a, a task as you, as you expect, but so you may find that there are areas where you can actually get agreement from your MP. Yeah, look, um, we've been, I've been pleasantly surprised by the response from the two MPs we spoke to. Uh, they're basically on side with us. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that, that's important to remember. And obviously, like you say, if, if you go in all guns blazing and expect them to be totally 100% um, on side and to... Uh, to totally reject the, uh, the current party line on, on it, uh, they may be a little less uh, less happy to speak. But if you if you can show that, well, actually, there's areas where there's a debate to be had, um, that allows you to open into a more more reasonable conversation. In my experience, so from from your experiences so far, what do you think you've learned from the from the experience of doing this in terms of? Oh uh, yeah, quite lobbying? quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. So learning points. First one: junk emails. Government email systems have various forms of separating out what they perceive to be junk email. My emails to my MP are disappearing into a junk folder somewhere deep inside Westminster. Um, the MP knows that. He's tried to get it corrected. It's not happened yet. Um, so if you don't get a reply from your MP by email, you need to send a letter by post. It might not be your, your MP ignoring you. But there are, 
I understand there are several layers of junk mail and the M if they go into a Westminster junk file, the MP won't even know it's in junk. He won't he or she won't see it. So if you get no reply by email, send a letter. And it's quite simple. It's your M your MP's name, Joe Bloggs, MP at House of Commons, London, SW1A0AA. SW1A0AA. It's as sim simple as that. That will get there. And that will be dealt. That will be dealt with by his uh, by his or her staff and brought to his or her attention. I must. Be, I was a bit frustrated by having no reply from uh, from my MP, but now I understand that it it, it makes it makes sense. So uh, we've sort of just discussed this one. Really, don't assume that all MPs support government policies, even if they're in government. They need. They are all individuals. Um, they all have their own view of the world. And they might be closer aligned to your views than you think. Should you meet your MP, go in an open mind and see see where they are, uh, where they are in, in relation to this uh, this uh, th th this ma matter? Because as you said, Colin, it, it could be there are points of uh, commonality between you both, and what might be an argument could turn into a uh, very useful meeting for both for both parties. Um. And, you know, if, if they don't like the view you're giving, if, you, if there is no commonality, then then you, at least you know where your MP stands. And remember, um, you are one of their voters. You are one of their constituents. And uh, at some at some point, they will need your vote. So you, you shouldn't be you won't be ignored by your MP. Um, but uh, at least you'll know where that MP stands um, on that issue. One key point that was raised in one of the meetings we had was just be aware that policies that government puts out are not always well thought through. They are policies designed to grab the headlines, designed to uh, um, attract, uh, designed to appease various people in the party. Um, the consequences of a policy are rarely thought out prior to that policy being announced. You might, you might, uh, the required outcomes might be uh, might be there, but how is how we're going to get there? How the country is going to get there to meet that policy is not always thought through. I'd have to say the comment I was rarely thought through. Um, the assumption in government, which surprised me, is that. Once a policy is announced, society will mould itself to allow that policy to happen. And I guess that does happen in a large number of cases. Um, but that assumption doesn't seem to be working on this uh, internal combustion engine ban. Society just cannot do it and is becoming increasingly unwilling to do it, it would appear. Um, and you can see that in in the uh, various articles in the in papers and on the internet, etc. Not headline news yet, but uh, they're getting in there. The queues of Teslas at at, at uh, charging points at bank holidays. The electric cars catching fire. The ship on fire with six electric cars on it that ruined the whole ship. All, all these things are all these things are coming. All these things are coming uh, coming to fruition. Um, and we haven't got that many electric cars on the road yet. It can, only, it can only get worse. So all these points were not considered by government when it announced the policy. Please don't think it has all been worked out. There is no there is no cost benefit analysis. There is no analysis of the effect on society. There's no analysis of, of how people will get to work if they can't afford an electric car. Nothing. It's just a policy designed to attract headlines and that. I guess in that respect, it's done it, but it's not going to serve us any uh, do us any favours when we're trying to uh, live our lives with a with a flat battery car. Um, what else have we learned? Yes, if you if you go to a meeting with an MP, prepare properly for it. Don't turn up don't turn up cold in, with nothing in your head and and nothing prepared. Take with you more headline facts and figures than you think you will need because it's surprising how they will come up at odd points in in conversation and MPs like headline facts and figures um, 
they like them and they're also wary of them because they'd hate to see an adverse headline fact appear in a, in a, in a, on a front page of a newspaper. Um, so those, those, those headline facts, take them with you, keep them in your back pocket. At some point in the meeting, you will have time to bring, those, bring some or all of those facts and figures out. And they do start to form a strong argument against this ill-conceived policy. The electric vehicles are not making that so say that they, they they are hitting the inner pages of the newspapers the, the the adverse impact electric vehicles they are hitting the various news feeds they will hit the front page soon as we get closer and closer to 2030 they will hit the front page but by then we might be getting way too late we need action now and that's that's the whole point of makes campaign and so a final point I've, I've learned, actually I've learned this over many years in my career, I've worked with, uh, I've met many MPs, I've worked as a school governor for many years and met MPs and now through MAG I've, I've met MPs as well. I've, all MPs I've met have been very capable and very, very clever people. You might not think that from how sometimes how they are presented on television and some of the some of the question time programs you see and etc cetera, etc cetera. but they are very very capable very very clever and they have got where they are because they because they are they are they are capable and clever after all i mean i couldn't get elected to parliament i don't think i'd want to but i i, I don't see that in my gift to do it but but they have done that so respect them for for what they are they are they are they are very good very good people they might not entirely agree with what you want to do but you know everyone's entitled to their own view it's a free it's a free country respect them for for what they are but they will absolutely want to whoever they are they will want to win a seat at the next election they want their party to win with a clear majority and they will listen to what you have to say because at the end of the day however clever they are and however capable they need your vote. So I guess that's what those are the key points of Blackpool Mouse learned from our lobbying thus far. I'm sure there'll be a few more coming out in the wash, but uh, that, that's where we are to date. Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, there, there, there's a lot of very, um, very good points that, that you've raised there. And I say, I think um, remembering to treat treat your member of parliament as another human being is, is always uh, is an important one. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, what your your comment about about MPs being being very intelligent and capable people may be quite may come across as quite a controversial statement <laughs> in many people's minds. But I think, yeah, we, we, when you stop back and you actually take the time to listen to people, they they generally have thought these subjects through. They're not necessarily the best informed on all subjects. I mean, you you got to remember that they they do as a, as a member of parliament have to deal with every subject under the sun. They're expected to have a well informed opinion on everything, and it's impossible for anybody um, to be that well informed on every single subject. But in many respects, that puts you in a position of strength because when it comes to motorcycling and policy that affects motorcycling, you are probably going to be better informed than your MP. Um, certainly, if you've read, if you've read articles in uh, in Open Road and seen some of the the research that gets discussed in there, some of, some of the background information that we're able to supply, um, that will be new information that you're actually giving giving to your MP in many cases. So, so don't be afraid to to to, to just think that yeah, they know more than I do. Um, because when it comes to motorcycling, unless you're one of the lucky few who've got an MP who rides a motorcycle. The probability is that they don't really know very much about the subject at all. Um, so yes, they may know broad brush um, about uh, the general policies around it and everything, but they're not going to know the detail. So yeah, don't ever feel um, a couple of you don't don't go in there with imposter syndrome. Uh, your opinion matters as much as anybody else's, um, and I think it's always important to get that across. Whether they agree with you or not is a different question, but you're more more likely to get them to agree with you if you can explain your, your point of view and why you've arrived at it. Um, they, they are generally willing to listen. Um, yeah, that's, I I think, mean, yeah that, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, I, I have, uh, people have looked surprised when I've said before that people are, that MPs are extremely capable, extremely clever and, and very intelligent. They are, but as you say, Colin, they do not know everything. And that is, that is the whole point of lobbying, of lobbying the MP. Motorcycles don't figure in government uh, workings 
hard, well, hardly anywhere. Um, they're, they're not they're not considered. So um, they'll be very very keen to get information from their constituents on a subject that they know little about. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the door is open for us. Absolutely, yeah. The, the the door the door is open. Some sometimes, like I say, it may, may take uh, quite a bit of knocking to get through spam filters. But one, once you're through the door, if you're if you're prepared to engage in a in a grown up manner, um, you're not not really going to meet meet very much resistance. I say, even if they do disagree with your point of view, they're going to want to hear it. They're also going to want to know how many other people hold a similar opinion to you. So, like I say. The more MPs that are hearing this message from from their constituents, as many parts of the country as possible, is really key to us being able to win on this um, particular issue because it is it is probably one of the the most complex and difficult issues that we've had to deal with uh, possibly in the full fifty years of Mag's, Mag's existence. Um, so yeah, it is one that I think potentially can have an enormous impact on not just motorcycling but transport in general. But uh, yeah, certainly for, for motorcycling and motorcyclists, as you and I are, um, this is going to have a significant impact on the future and what it looks like. Um, and you've got every right to have your say on it. Yep. Well, that's that, that's that, that's what we found in 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 Blackpool Mag, and I hope that's of use to other to other people uh, watching this. It it does seem like a lot of work to get to meet your MP, to get to write your MP, but it is it is worthwhile. Um, it's absolutely worthwhile because none of them have much interest or knowledge of motorcycling. So let's 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 inform them. That's brilliant. Couldn't agree with you more. Is there anything else that you wanted to add before we uh, we wrap this one up? Uh, well, I just say I'm um, you know on a, on a personal note, and I get upset a few people saying this sometimes. If if electric motorcycles worked as well as petrol engine motorcycles, I'd 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 have one tomorrow. But they don't. And the fact is, if they were to our country could, could not support all the electric motorcycles and electric vehicles that we that we need to. Um, but if I wanted to buy one, in any case, it should be, should be my choice, not compulsion. And I'd ask everyone watching this to support Mag in in, uh, in lobbying uh, lobbying their MPs to um, get the information across before this policy gets too much further down the road. That's it, indeed. It's, it's like, like the uh, the well-established mag strap line, let the rider decide. That's it, yes, let the rider decide, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank, thanks very much for this, uh, David, and um, hopefully we'll speak again in the future. Okay, back to work now. Okay. Okay.